Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Dr. Victoria Coleman, who is the Chief Scientist of the United States Air Force. Victoria Coleman, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Good morning, John. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. The conversation I'd like to have with you today, Victoria, will cover national defense, science, technology, and innovation. But before we get into these topics, could we start by getting your assessment of our strategic landscape? So let's see. So uh, the world that I live in, John, you know, it's um, it's really trying to be responsive to the threat environment that the United States finds itself in uh, in uh, you know in 2022, which is you know a little different than it was um, you know even a decade ago. So um, you know we find ourselves in a situation where we now have um, a peer competitor um, that uh, is well-resourced, uh, is far away from us, um, and uh, knows how we fight. So these three kind of strategic advantages that China has um, are really presenting us with a bunch of challenges. And, and, and I have to say that just about everybody inside the Department of the Air Force is squarely focused on understanding that threat, you know, um, you know, parceling it out and figuring out how to go about responding to, again, a threat that in some ways, you know, it's it we haven't seen the likes of before. Um, and we can talk about that more if you like. But, you know, for us, honestly, it's mostly about um, how do we you know, compete successfully uh, with, uh, with China and um, how do we make sure that we in the Department of the Air Force are ready should that competition veer into into conflict, for example, um, it it consumes just about every waking moment <laughs> from us. Right, and over the last few years, while you've been in government, I'm sure you have observed some kind of a um, I don't know slow or or maybe rapid shift in the day to day working environment relative to China. Would you say that that's fair? Uh, it is. It is. So we have a you know, both this administration and the previous one. You know, through their uh, kind of political appointees, you know, they've made China a priority. Um, I think the difference that I see is, you know, perhaps in you know in you know, 2016 onwards, the focus was on China as a um, as an emerging threat. Um, when I look at uh, this kind of administration, is at least in the Department of the Air Force, is more about how to go respond. So there's, there was a recognition phase, and now it's like, oh goodness, what do we do about it? Right. Mm. So, I you know, if if I had to distinguish between the two, I would say that's the uh, the distinguishing feature for me. As the chief scientist of the United States Air Force, you advise both the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff, and the Chief of Space Operations. So all three of them on a wide range of scientific and technical issues. Uh, what are the Secretary of the Air Force's priorities with regard to science, technology, and innovation? So, so you know, I think the uh, the, the tagline, and uh, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, and I apologize, but the Secretary, you know, uh, you know, you, every time you see him, he will say China, China, China. So there is nothing more important in his mind than that, and I think in, the, in his particular case, because. You know, he was in government and then he left government. He was on the outside for four years. And sometimes, you know, when you come back into it, when you jump back into it, uh, you know, all these things that you kind of knew about, but, you know, you got, you got desensitized to while you were in the job, all of a sudden become really, really clearly defined. Uh, so his priority is honestly almost 100% to put us in a place where you are more competitive uh, against uh, you know, against uh, against China. Now, for S and T in particular, um, we find ourselves in an interesting situation. That's you know, that's science and technology. 
science and technology. That's yeah. right. Uh, yeah. So, so that really refers, you know, um, in, in my in my mind, it refers to the earlier stages of the pipeline of building something out. Um, given his urgency, and I have to say, the urgency of the rest of us uh, around the, kind of the China competition, the secretary really wants to understand how we how we get better at transitioning capability from the lab uh, to uh, to operations. And, and, you know, that's a nut that's really hard to crack. Um, it's not like there are many organizations inside and outside the government that know how to do this really well. So for us, the challenge is, you know, work on the right things, uh, make sure that they're connected to the uh, to the warfighter, make sure that we know how we're going to transition them and then execute, you know, really kind of, you know, execute as well as, uh, as, uh, as we can. Um, he ha he has given us, and and this is uh, you know this is not new, but he has given us uh, some areas of um, um, so, some priority areas, if you like, to to focus on. He calls this uh, these things the uh, his operational imperatives. So, in other words, you know, taking a broad look across across the technology and landscape that you know um, brings together artifacts that we need for our mission, the kinds of things that the secretary is prioritizing. Uh, I guess we won't be surprising, but you know, building a resilient space architecture is one of the things that he cares a lot about because space, you know, in space we are postured for, um, you know, for a, a peacetime domain. We're not, we're not postured for a contested domain when it comes to space. And of course, you know, this is this is the reason why the space was was created in the first place. Mm -hmm. But as well as having the service, we need to have. The associated technology and capability. So that's one of the key priorities. Building out um, collaboration amongst our platforms is another one of this uh, of these priorities that he has. You know, for for the longest time, um, you know, the Air Force um, and we're comfortable with this. We build big platforms like well, the likes of the F thirty five and so on that tend to stick around for a long time. And I think there's a recognition inside of the department that um, we need to have a more Kind of you know agile a more composable force structure which means you know pairing different platforms together and making them work well together um really requires a step up in the autonomy and kind of capability that uh, that we have so you know that begins to give you a sense i would say another kind of key priority for him um is all around resilient basing again the nature of the competition that we face today will require us to fight differently if we have to fight then you know god knows all of us hope that that day will never come but if we have to fight in the pacific that's a very different environment than it was you know in 1944 like 45 1946 right it's um areas uh, like guam for example that once upon a time used to be sanctuary and they are mm. postured like that are no longer sanctuary so that is really pushing us to think um think about you know different ways that we could succeed there um one of the fundamental kind of strategies that the air force is is building is something called agile combat employment we'll call it ace uh for short and ace is all about you know building out the ability to function uh in a dispersed kind of environment and being much more agile in how we do that so that is you know a very kind of well-defined many ways operational concept but in order to realize that, you need technology and you need science, uh, science and technology to be done to enable it, right? So, so as the secretary has put out his uh, his priorities, uh, the S and T is kind of following, uh, you know, his, uh, his 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 cues, and we are prioritizing adjusting programs to to, to be able to prioritize the things that um, the, the capabilities that you know, uh, he recognizes we need in order to uh, to be more effective in our competition. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, one one common theme that I heard in your response there was that we have so much capability, but the capability was built over the course of several decades or many decades, which were relatively uncontested. And Therefore, the capability, the the technology that we've relied upon for many years now is um, uh, uh, the uh, back or the the uh, back end security of the technology 
tends to not be up to today's challenge. So the one one of the technical challenges is somehow retrofitting security onto all of all of our technology stack uh, while simultaneously uh, upgrading the technology stack or you know adopting new technologies and so it's it's kind of like there are you know, we have feet in in two canoes when it comes to uh, tech technological uh, enhancement would you say that that's fair I think that that is a a, a very um, you know, very graphical but very accurate way of describing <laughs> the predicament yeah. that uh, that we find uh, find ourselves in. Because you know we you know for, for the longest time you know following nine uh, eleven we've been focusing on uh, counterterrorism, right? It, it was it was that threat that um, you know operationally we were we were getting after, and while we were doing that, um, you know over uh, in China. First of all, people were watching us, so they they saw, um, you know, what we did well and what we didn't do so well, and that, um, you know, alongside, frankly, the expansion, the vast expansion of their economy, gave them the opportunity to really kind of pick up speed uh, and momentum, and start delivering capabilities that, um, you know, really are are challenging to us. Uh, I think one of the things that. Um, they do, I think, exceptionally well uh, is, you know, their ability to coordinate and, you know, have a kind of mutually supporting relationship between uh, kind of their commercial, um, you know, technology development and, you know, an activity and what they need to do on the military side. So, you know, they, have, they call this military civil fusion. And, you know, it basically it requires every single company that is, that, you know, um, is, is important on the commercial side they have a strategy for supporting also the military objectives uh, of, uh, of of the PRC. Um, you know, if, if if you were to translate that in you know in U.S. terms, uh, it really would sound uh, you know quite um, kind of unbelievable, right? That you would have Google, for example, lining up with what the DoD wants to do. Um, I don't think that's going to happen until you know, hell freezes over. Is Helps an expression that one could use. So, so I, I, I think uh, because they, you know, they were watching us because we took our, our eyes off the competition, uh, because their economic development really kind of picked up speed. They were able to use all these factors uh, to, uh, to really, you know, um, build capabilities that are challenging us today. Yeah. So, uh, how do you, you and your team? How, how do you go about gathering information? and providing advice to the Secretary of the Air Force. Um, I mean, answer that in, in whatever way that you like, but if, but for for example, what, what organizations do you intend to gauge, engage with the most? Um, what does your team composition look like mm -hmm. that helps provide advice? And, um, and also what organizations would you like to engage with more? So uh, our office is, um, is, you know, is very singular, let's say. Um, the chief scientist position actually predates the creation of uh, of the Air Force. You know, it's 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 carving out from uh, from the Department of the Army. Um, I am number thirty seven, so you know I have thirty six predecessors, and I have to say that each one of them, uh, you know, did this job differently. Um, so one one thing that we all have in common, however, is that we're all coming from the outside. So by definition, this role is temporary. People coming from the outside with a kind of with, with without a lot of inertia, um, and you know, like you get to speak the truth, <laughs> you speak truth to power. Um, we have um, zero budget, and that's by design uh, because it means that the position uh, is truly independent. It's not like you know you have set of programs that. You know, you have a vested interest in supporting and executing. Um, so, you know, our job is really to give objective uh, advice across the board, and that is a very broad portfolio. You know, if you think about the kinds of technologies that we need in the department, you know, it's uh, it's it really can be overwhelming. Um, our office is also very small, so we have, um, depending how you count, three or four billets. Um, we actually have more like twelve people in the office because here's the magic. Uh, 
the position is very senior. So it means that you have access. And if you do a good job, you can influence not by position or budget, but by knowledge. You know, there are positions that, you know, give you position, well, position power. There are other roles that give you knowledge power. So this is definitely in the, in the second category. So we don't have any shortage of people that want to come work with us. Um, and some of them come work with us for a little while, maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe two. Uh, they work on specific things that we care about and they care about, perhaps things that they're experts in. And we use that uh, kind of that work to influence uh, to influence outcomes. Um, you know, who do we talk to? Um, you know, I you know I've worked virtually all my career outside of government, so I feel like I know at least the commercial side of the world that we uh, that we're operating pretty well. What I don't know, frankly, is the inside. So what I've always prioritized, you know, since day one, and I continue to do so, is learning a lot more about the uh, uh, the Air Force and the Space Force because, you know, I see my role not as kind of being the court jester, right, the person that, that calls the bullshit, but I want to help solve some problems. Why is that? Overall, the Department of the Air Force, um, you know, if you, if you look at our and the number of scientists and engineers that we have in the department, it's actually 6% of the workforce. Um, in 1985, that percentage was 20%. Mm. So, so what you see is, you know, with the fall of the Soviet Union, again, you know, we took our kind of, uh, you know, first took our eye off the ball, but also we stopped making investments on kind of the tech side of the house, which means that the Air Force itself now finds um, itself in a situation where we don't have enough organic technical competence inside the department to do some of this work, which means that lots of things that could be done, can be done, are, but are enabled by technology actually don't get done because we don't have the expertise. So, you know, in my tenure, I think, you know, what I want to leave behind is solving some key problems that otherwise wouldn't have been solved because we don't have as much expertise, but also are going to make a lasting kind of impact on that very same expertise. When I leave the department, I want us to have, you know, organically many more people that could do the kind of work that I do. And we do this through a variety of means. One is, you know, with a, with a management initiative uh, around raising this technical competency in the department that we've been leading. Another one that I'm really proud of actually is building uh, the first ever um, university affiliated research center for the Department of the Air Force. Um, we announced this in, uh, um, I guess in, in June. Um, it will be not only the first one in the department, but it will also be the first one that will be led by a historical black uh, college and university in, in HBCU. And it will be focused on autonomy, which of course is one of these kind of key areas that we know we need to, uh, to enable our mission. So, you know, we're, we're doing that because we know that will be an enduring kind of presence in that community and it will help us to build a long-term, you know, substantive relationship with the HBCU uh, STEM community because we need, you know, we need more uh, technologists into the new department. We also need a more diverse uh, uh, pool to uh, to hire from. Uh, so these are, you know, the, the two um, kind of angles, if you like, of the work that I'm doing. One is solve some key technical problems because otherwise people die, which is not a good outcome. Uh, and the other one is, you know, systematically get the department to be at a better place to leverage technology in the future, a long time after myself and the secretary are gone. And we will have a link for those who are interested to learn more about this uh, press release that that you mentioned uh, on establishing that, that UARC. Um, could we get your take on operations in the information environment? And, um, you know, so how, how does that fit into the picture with your current role with the Air Force, uh, what, in your opinion, are we doing right, and where do we need improvement? Uh, so, thank you for asking that. And and I, I think it's a, first of all, it's a topic that I personally deeply care about. You know, just because of my my uh, my my background, uh, my work uh, in the Wikimedia uh, movement, um, the role of information, uh, the role of connectivity, uh, that. Uh, you know, uh, the internet has given us uh, the kind of the group empowerment. And I've seen these forces really at play uh, kind of firsthand. And I know that they affect the 
um, the mission of the Air Force, both in terms of our ability uh, to um, uh, to execute missions, but also our ability to shape the environment in which we will execute those missions. Um, one very specific kind of area that I personally am very interested in uh, and uh, I, I have written a little bit about is uh, this whole area of digital human rights. In other words, understanding how um, how we can del deliberately and systematically build tools to counter what I call digital authoritarians. You know, this this uh, this use of uh, information technology to uh, to surveil, to suppress, to manipulate, to deny. Um, you know, citizens of our country and other countries, um, you know, what are considered to be fundamental human rights. Um, I get a lot about that. And I and I, I, I think, um, you know, the average citizen, both in the United States and in China, uh, e care equally about uh, about those things. And it's, it's a complicated issue because there are policy aspects, but there are also very significant technology aspects. And, you know, one thing that we're really not good at, I think, in the United States, is melding those two things together. Mm. So, you know, we tend to develop policy separately from technology and technology separate from policy, and then we throw it in the mix and we hope some something good could, would come out. That's not how our competition. Back to your point about China appears to be especially good at that military civil fusion. It, yeah. uh, it, not, not, not that we want to, uh, you know, uh, emulate China fully, but there is uh, something that that they are uh, good at doing, which we might be able to take a take a note from. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's nothing about what uh, China does in this space that is not well uh, well thought out and executed. So, to give you an example, right? Um, and maybe this is a rabbit hole, but I think it's worth mentioning that you know they have, uh, of course, the Cyberspace Administration of China. Um, and that's just one of the multiplicity of, of agencies that they had that they have that regulate the sensor and the control overall the, the internet. So if you look at this cyberspace administration of China, it's actually the majority owner of the China Internet Investment Fund, which in turn um, has significant ownership stakes in companies like Weibo, ByteDance, SenseTime, all these kind of key companies that implement the internet right inside of china they they are controlling investments right so if if you look at uh at us uh it really is hard to like to find a place in government that has uh you know kind of the singular focus of you know developing well understanding the problem developing mitigations deploying mitigations to include both technology and policy it just doesn't exist and you know there are like the dod has equities the air force has equities state has equities the intelligence community, treasury, commerce, you name it. Um, but, you know, when everybody is responsible, you know what they say, nobody is responsible. So it, it, it is it is asymmetric, um, without a doubt. Um, and, and, you know, I think it denies us the opportunity to kind of to shape the information environment uh, in the places where we want to, um, you know, to get word about, um, you know, our approach to, uh, you know, to problems. Um, as well as um, our, you know, our philosophy, right? So, so you know, the United States is defined by a set of ideas, and communicating these sets of ideas, which I, th I think are very compelling, requires access and ability to share that widely. And today, it's impossible to do that in China. It is very, very difficult for us to get a democracy message uh, across because of the way that. Uh, the, 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 the Communist Party has placed this stranglehold uh, on, uh, on information society uh, there. So, you know, th that's a very kind of generic answer that I think applies, you know, certainly broadly and outside of the Department of the Air Force. But within the Department of the Air Force, one of the things, uh, one of the kinds of information that we want to be very thoughtful about is what we reveal to the world about our systems, our technologies, and what we conceal. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes you build a capability and you want people to know about it because if they know about it, that will deter them from doing certain things. So that's where deterrence comes in. Uh, sometimes you don't want to know them uh, about it because you know if uh, if 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 they if they knew it, it would um, it might perhaps negate the advantages and so on. So while you know we are reasonably good and skilled at 
building plank a classification guides that says you know what has to be classified and what can be shared publicly i don't think we are um you know as thoughtful as we need to be uh around deciding when it comes to technology advantage uh, or strategy what we tell the world and what we don't tell the world and that is you know um that is a gap that we are working to uh, to fix again this is one of the uh uh, one of the priorities that Secretary Kendall uh, brought uh, with him. And we are trying overall to be much more thoughtful about how we use information about our own work uh, as a strategic advantage uh, in the competition. I didn't mention this in the intro, but uh, one does not get to become the chief scientist for the Air Force without having a uh, stunning career uh, before that. And so I didn't mention, but you were the director of DARPA for a couple of years here recently, and you've held a variety of leadership roles with organizations. And this is all in your bio, but to our audience, uh, Samsung, Hewlett Packard, Nokia, Yahoo, Harman International Industries, Technicolor, and you mentioned a moment ago, the Wikimedia Foundation. So um, my goodness, what a, what a resume that is. And so the question that I have for you, Victoria, is what did you learn from these corporate experiences that you are bringing into uh, the national security roles that, that you've had? And what's your take on collaborations and partnerships? Um, are we engaging appropriately, uh, sufficiently with the commercial sector? So, so first of all, thank you for, for the kind words. I, I, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades. You know, some people would say I can't keep down a job, um, but I, I've, I've had the opportunity in my career to learn lots of, uh, lots of things and, I, and I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, you know, the world has changed about a hundred times since I, I began my career in this field. We uh, in the department uh, will recognize that, uh, especially you know, after kind of the peace dividend of uh, of the end of the Cold War, that uh, the the center of gravity for technology development evolution has shifted outside of the uh, the confines of the uh, defense industrial base or the defense enterprise. So we know that, uh, and it has changed the world. Um, we are thoughtful about how we approach that, how we bring some of that goodness into the department. I would say, however, that we're still at the start of this, um, of building out the skill set. Again, you know, if, if you were to look at the way China does that, I would give them an A+. Plus. If I look at the way that we do it, maybe a C-. minus. Um, there is, uh, so I think there's a ton of opportunity for us to continue uh, building those relationships and bringing that brilliance of the commercial sector into our operations. And sometimes, you know, that's technology. You know, maybe there is, uh, maybe there's a network, you know, uh, advance that, you know, the, the telcos created that we can bring it to help us say good battle management. Um, you know, maybe there's a security, um, you know, defense mechanism that somebody has developed that we can bring. There's a ton of these things. But it goes a lot deeper than that, right? The commercial world works very differently from the government. Um, and I would say, you know, the one kind of distinguishing factor is speed. Uh, things happen quickly outside. They happen very slowly inside. Um, that means that, you know, if you're a company, um, you get feedback about your product, about, you know, about your approach, your business model really, really quickly. Um, and that gives you the opportunity then, you know, to experiment quickly. And for those companies that can change and adjust to, to go down different pathways so that you eventually succeed. Um, you know, in, in business, you know, that can, you know, that cadence can be counted in quarters. Uh, in the DOD, you know, the feedback that we get, it, it, it happens at the decade level. And again, if you think about it, right? So, you know, we were fighting the war on terror, China over here was developing. It took us literally two decades to get the feedback to say, well, you know, actually what you've been developing uh, so far is not gonna cut it in this new environment. So, you know, the one thing that I know is that we need to bring this, somehow we need to engineer a faster feedback loop into our thinking, our ways of working, our execution inside of the government. The other thing that happens in the world outside is there are consequences. And now, you know, I may sound, you know, a little, um, <laughs> I don't know, a little harsh, but, uh, you know, as a CEO of a, of a company, you can't afford to miss too many quarters. And if you do, you know, then uh, somebody else will come and be the CEO. 
uh, in government, I think that degree of accountability uh, isn't there, especially in our procurement practices, our acquisition practices. I have seen it where, you know, when when a program you know begins to go sideways, uh, we just give it more money. And then we'll give it more money because, you know, oftentimes, you know, we think, oh, you know, with just a bit more money, we'll get it all. And it's like, we have in some ways too little time, but too much money. If we had <laughs> less money in some ways, I think our discipline for choosing and picking what we work on would be a lot sharper. So I, I think that, you know, that, that is an overall um, kind of sense that I have when I look at how we work in the government and how, you know, I used to work on, uh, on the outside. Um, if you take it one kind of level deeper, it's not just about technology, it's not just about speed, it's about ways of getting things done. Um, you know, for example, you know, one, one, one example is this whole notion of agile software development, you know, you will have heard about DevSecOps and so on. You know, the world outside learned this lesson because we could no longer develop large pieces of software the way that we used to when we developed small pieces of software. And how did we do that? By failing. <laughs> the more you failed, the more incentivized you were mm. to find other ways of doing it. So we figured mm -hmm. this out. In the government, you fail and like, okay, so here's more time, here's more money. Uh, eventually, you know, we were able to get, uh, you know, agile software development to be uh, an aspiration, in one case, a reality inside of, uh, of the department. That's not a specific technology. It's a way of doing things. It's, it's, it's an, as Andy Grove used to call it, it's a best known method. So there's lots of things that we can learn from industry that can help us just like, you know, compensate for the, for, for, for the fact that our feedback cycles are so, um, are so slow, um, if, if that makes sense. It does. And uh, you really painted that picture nicely. And one of the reasons why I, I love having these conversations with s such a variety of people that have different perspectives on these challenges is uh, what what I learn. And uh, you're the, this is the first time I've heard someone articulate uh, things just the way you did. Uh, you know, I've heard plenty of people talk you know, not just on the podcast, but else elsewhere about the the speed of innovation in the commercial sector compared to government, for example. But you you I I think you really hit upon uh, maybe one of the key uh, driving forces behind innovation speed, and that's market feedback and uh, commercial organizations uh, uh, have to make money uh, you know no no money no mission uh, and, <laughs> and, right. and 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 no, no margin no mission and uh, if 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 a commercial organization is not being responsive to market demand that's that I'm, I'm I'm curious have you ever heard of a concept called the red queen hypothesis no, is, is no, that haven't. is that familiar to you? No, uh, it, it is. Uh, I believe uh, I'll have a link in the show notes. I you know going from memory here, but I believe it's rooted in evolutionary biology, and it base so it it uh, references Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland. When Alice gets to Wonderland, she encounters the Red Queen, and the Red Queen says something like this to Alice about. Yeah, whatever they're getting ready to do, I, I forget the whole story. But she says to Alice, uh, "In order to, uh, in order to go somewhere here, you have to continually run faster and faster and faster." And there is, like I said, it's actually rooted in evolutionary biology, where there's a phenomenon where uh, the evolutionary process uh, forces the players within the system to adapt increasingly quicker in order to outcompete, you know, whatever the competitors are within the ecosystem. And I, I think that we are experiencing that. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like Moore's law. Uh, <laughs> uh, things, things are happening quicker and quicker and quicker compared to the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And so we are experiencing all of this uh especially vividly uh today as we have this crunch of competition and the need to do something asap and i i, I think all of that is kind of uh, 
uh, integrated into everything that you were just describing between government and uh, commercial innovation. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think what's changed, you know, post the industrial era, right, is the fact that, you know, this is the information era. Um, and information um, and uh, networks and the way it spreads, uh, I, I think that is honestly what is speeding up the clock. Um, and, uh, you know, parts of our government are still in the cocoon. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a time warp, <laughs> and we, we need to uh, we need to bring them out of it. Uh, perhaps we can do a very quick lightning round, Victoria, before we close out. Um, sure. So these are just kind of like word association with with short short little quick takes from you, please. Um, talent. Uh, we need some. <laughs> we uh, we need more uh, technical talent inside of the department. We need people that work on the outside to come inside and teach us all these uh, all these personal methods so that uh, they used to be successful outside. Right, and also back to your earlier mention about the uh, UARC being yeah. developed at the historical Black University as well. So it's a diversity of talent too. Video games. Oh, video games. Well, uh, I I don't play any. <laughs> my kids uh, my kids enjoy them uh i i think uh games in general um can teach us a lot in the air force we play futures game uh we try to imagine what the conflict would be like and i think the results of those of those games are often spectacular so um i, I should probably teach myself to play some video games <laughs> uh, interdisciplinary studies or research well, that's where the magic happens. You know, in science, the big advances happen at the seams between different disciplines. Uh, you know, if you look at the seam between, for example, biology and information, that's where systems biology, synthetic biology came up. This is why we were able to build out a messenger RNA vaccine in 29 days for COVID. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think we, again, we need more of that. <laughs> Human sense making. Oh, human sense making. Yeah, that's that's kind of um, that's an interesting um, kind of cue. Um, you know, each one of us carries you know their own like little infosphere, like a little bubble about the things that we know. Um, it would be nice if our bubbles, you know, interacted more, um, you know, and overlapped more than they do today. If if we'd find some way of using collective intelligence to get human sense making to be much more effective, much faster than it is today. Wouldn't that be amazing? I don't know how to do it, but it would be great. Yeah. In November of this year, in just a couple of short months, suppose we, we are supposed to cross the 8 billion people threshold on Earth. What's your hot take on 8 billion people on Earth? Okay. Can I be flippant? <laughs> That's yes. a whole lot of diapers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, um, you know, our planet... Um, our planet has meaning because of uh, the people on it. Um, I hope that as a society, you know, we can collectively continue to uh, to work together towards great outcomes for all uh, eight billion people on this planet. And we all know that, you know, that that's not uniformly true today. Um, I um, I, I think there's a great deal of optimism in parts of the world where some of this population, um, you know, uh, explosion is happening in Africa and other places. Um, it's uh, it's great to be part of it. It's great to be one of the 8 billion. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I agree. Um, two, two final questions, please. Um, we have a lot of students and researchers who listen to this podcast. Could you offer a fruitful research question that is either related to the kinds of things we've been discussing or something that is maybe uh, personally important to you that uh, that people can take a crack at. Well, can I challenge you know, your, your listeners and your students to, to think about this uh, digital human rights concept, right? Where you, know, you have, especially in a, in a democracy, you have this tension between protecting individual freedoms, but at the same time, making sure that uh, these individual freedoms do not impact collective freedoms through, for example, misinformation and so on. Um, it's, a, it's a hard nut to crack. There is a technology piece uh, that is very important, uh, but, but also there's a policy piece that has to be you know, co-evolved uh, because technology itself doesn't know how it's going to get used. Our technology is never evil or otherwise. Um, 
So let's build out the technology, let's build out the policy to make sure that we protect both uh, group outcomes as, as well as individual ones with a view to understanding, establishing, protecting, promulgating human rights across the globe for all these 8 billion people. Right. And last last question, please. Um, what's a good book or perhaps another online resource that uh, people can go and check out uh, that they may not be aware of or something that's on your nightstand right now? What What's a good book for people? <laughs> so, I, you know, I. Um, so my nightstand right now is, is actually uh, the romance of the three kingdoms. So um, I need the uh, now, all of us, I think, need to understand China better. So I'm learning Chinese and I'm reading, um, you know, Chinese literature. I don't know that that's necessarily, I think it's, it's, a, it's a bit uh, um, bit quirky, but I do have a recommendation. Uh, there's a book uh, called Here Comes Everybody. Uh, I don't know if you know it. it the, the author is Clay Shirky. Um, he talks about the power of organizing without organizations. Uh, it, it's a great, um, great analysis of, for example, uh, how the community that is building and curating Wikipedia came together. Um, it talks about um, the, um, you know, the way information spreads, spreads in groups um, uh, in ways that are very different today than they were before, you know, the, the, uh, the emergence of the internet. Uh, it's, it's a great way to, you know, to understand how uh, information is changing the way that we live and work and how it enables outcomes such as Wikipedia that are entirely unexpected. So I would highly recommend it. And it's an easy read. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you for those suggestions. And Dr. Victoria Coleman, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. Real pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.